This figure shows the plan view of the streamlines to a pumping well in a regional groundwater flow field in dark blue color and the regional groundwater flow field in light blue color. Note the position of the stagnation point in this figure. Please note that stagnation is not limited to this point, but that there is a stagnation curve in between the regional groundwater flow and the groundwater flow to the well. Good use can be made of a recharge well and pumping well to hydrologically isolate and treat polluted subsoil, a process generally known as pump and treat. This figure shows pump and treat the hydrological isolation of polluted subsoil by a pumping well indicated with a small circle with discharge Q1 to the left and a recharge well here to the right with recharge Q2. Importantly, Q1 equals minus Q2. The left part of this figure is equivalent to the plan view of a well in a regional groundwater flow field. It thus shows streamlines in a regional groundwater flow field as influenced by pumping well Q1. If the subsoil to the right of the pumping well is polluted, the polluted water can be drawn to the pumping well and treated, after which clean water is injected, recharged upstream. When the injection rate Q2 of well 2 is taken equal to the pumping rate Q1 of well 1, thus Q1 equals minus Q2, and with the right setup concerning the distance between the wells and the actual pumping rate Q1, the polluted area is captured in a symmetrical water lens isolated from the regional groundwater flow system as evident from the streamlines given in dark color. Because of the continued pumping and recharge, the subsoil will get cleaner and cleaner still with the passing of time. As mentioned before, this hydrological isolation is an example of a technique more generally called pump and treat. Hydrological isolation of polluted subsoil is a very cost-effective measure as costs of pumping and injection or recharge are very low, especially when compared to measures such as excavation and or isolation of polluted soil by clay dams or concrete structures. A major threat to the production of drinking water in industrial countries is caused by the subsoil presence of trichloroethylene. Trichloroethylene, abbreviated to TCE, in Dutch abbreviated to TRI, is a chlorinated hydrocarbon commonly used as an industrial solvent. TCE is a co-carcinogen substance acting together with other substances to promote the formation of tumors. It cannot easily be removed from the subsoil. Since TCE is heavier than water and has a low solubility value, it is classified as a DNAPL, a dense non-aqueous phase liquid. A DNAPL will tend to sink through the groundwater column until it encounters an impermeable layer in the subsurface. When the impermeable layer is tilted, as for instance in an ice pushed ridge, the DNA apple will sink further along the dip of this impermeable material, independent of the direction of the groundwater flow, thus not necessarily with the groundwater flow. In lawsuits with respect to who is responsible for polluting the subsoil with TCE or another DNA apple, this should be taken into account. What should a drinking water authority do when in a field of pumping wells TCE is found in the pumped water from one of the wells? Shut down that well? No, surely not. What the drinking water authority should do is continue, even increase the pumping discharge of this well, and by this try to draw all subsurface polluted groundwater 
to this one contaminated well. Of course, do not use the pumped up water from this well as drinking water anymore and keep a thorough check on the groundwater quality of the other wells in the field. Investigate the geographical spread of the TCE pollution in the subsurface and take all necessary mitigation measures. Groundwater can be polluted with nitrate from farming activities. In the Netherlands, this led to high nitrate concentrations in the upper groundwater. Here we have concentrations. Here we have the Netherlands, and you see for this part of the Netherlands, quite high values from 50 to 150 milligram per liter in the upper groundwater. However, in the lower groundwater, nitrate levels are low. This has to do with the occurrence of pyrite, iron sulfide, deeper down in the subsurface. The sulfur in pyrite oxidizes to sulfate. This oxidation is not by oxygen, which is not present deeper down in the subsurface, but by the nitrate in the groundwater. This so-called anoxic oxidation of pyrite by nitrate results in the release of sulfate. In this way, nitrate and sulfate in the groundwater effectively cancel each other out. Arsenic occurs as a coupled substitution in the pyrite structure. Toxic levels of naturally occurring arsenic in groundwater for use as drinking water are a major threat to more than 100 million people worldwide, mainly in South and Southeast Asia, dramatically raising their risk for cancer and other serious diseases. High levels of arsenic can be found in drinking water from deep drilled wells, which is particularly true for Bangladesh. The left figure shows these high levels for Bangladesh. As a reference, the US Environmental Protection Agency sets an arsenic maximum contaminant level for public water supplies at 10 micrograms per liter. This figure shows concentrations over 10 micrograms per liter for large parts of Bangladesh, with even values over 300 microgram per liter. As you can see to the right, the sustainable treatment of arsenic contaminated groundwater by a removal technique called electrocoagulation has been the topic of a Friday evening science talk, FEST, by Dr. Kees van Genuchte at our Faculty of Geosciences, Utrecht University.